Okay, we're back on the internet. John asked, do you believe it's right to withhold Miranda rights from any American? I guess that's being asked because I think I saw right before mm -hmm. I came on the air uh, yes. that they were holding with Miranda rights from the, the suspect, yeah. unibrow bomber. Yeah, correct. They're calling him a high-value detainee. And what does that mean and why are we doing that? And why, why don't we rely on, why don't we have faith in our justice system? Uh, well, in the past, for a high-value detainee, you don't read him as Miranda rights because you want to get information from him and you don't want the lawyer called into the room immediately. And, you know, these are for, you know, enemy non-combatants who, it could be argued, don't necessarily deserve Miranda rights at this point in the process. You're trying to squeeze information out of them. You're trying to find out what, what other plots might be ongoing. And as we know, with this case, uh, there are three other people detained, so perhaps it is a larger plot. We really just don't know yet. Could I just interject? There's actually a Supreme Court case from the 1980s which says if there's a, there's a public safety exception, and it dealt with a guy who secreted a, uh, a gun in a supermarket. So the Supreme Court has actually ruled on this. We don't have to go to enemy combatants and all that kind of uh, Bush quasi-law. Uh, there's actually a Supreme <laughs> Court decision on this, and it says if there's an imminent threat, so where's the gun? That kind of thing. The other thing is with Abdul Muttalib, the underwear bomber who on December 25th, 2009, was uh, arrested, um, there were actually two teams of FBI agents, one who questioned him from a national security perspective, and that evidence was only used to protect the nation. Another team protected, uh, another team asked him questions for prosecution. Right. But I, I do, I, I, it does make me feel profoundly uncomfortable when we make exceptions on things like Miranda. Mm -hmm. And I think that this time is we, we, we pursue a tactical advantage that, okay, we want to get any tactical advantage we can right here, but there's a real strategic cost to doing that. And I think that so often the way we pursue things, we, we pursue this tactical advantage and lose strategically. Yeah. Okay, you may be right, but there's Supreme Court though, precedent. can't be used in court against the, mm. you know, detainee. I just think just read in the damn rights. You know, trust our system. Uh, trust the system. I think so. I mean, because otherwise what you're saying is, really, we want to have him in a room with no lights and beat him up. That's, that's, that's really what you're saying. No. Um. <laughs> no, really what I'm saying is you're trying to, you know, find and out if this is a ticking time bomb scenario or yeah. not. And you yeah. said if there is imminent threat that that person does not have to be read their Miranda rights to try to tackle well, that these threat. Are, it's like enhanced interrogation techniques. It's like a euphemism for torture. Which, uh... <laughs> Tor torture is quite different than not having your rights read. There, there, there's, there, there's a difference. I mean, I, and I'm not supporting one way or the other. What I am saying is this, this is not extrajudicial. There's a Supreme Court precedent for this, and I think that torture is a, is, is a different thing. You, your rights are there. I think there's a legitimate issue as to, uh, and I happen to believe as a former mm. police officer that you should read people their rights. However, there's a difference between not being read your rights and having them and being tortured. Yeah, but so you think he's going to be... a message out to the world, I mean, to Putin, to China, when we, when we make these kinds of exceptions. I, I remember Chinese officials telling me when I was complaining about their abuse of, or taking shortcuts, mm -hmm. oh, if, we, if you faced our problems, then you would do the same thing. And I was, you know, saying, oh, we would never do that. And then 9-11 happened, and we, I kind of felt I needed to write We didn't need apology. to make exceptions to defeat the Nazis or the Soviet Union. But that's not true. We, the, the Kirin case in the 1940s, Korematsu, we, we locked up Japanese Americans. We took enemy combatants. Yeah, that's true. We took enemy combatants with, without a civilian trial, uh, tried six of them out of eight, and we executed them. That was Roosevelt, a Democrat. And that was a source of, of not of national strength, but of weakness. national weakness, I think. But I don't think it's fair to say that questioning a suspect is the equivalent of torturing them. We, we question them in the court, you know, and try to build a case against them. They get mm. questioned in court, they get questioned by police. That's not torture, that's investigation. No, but to question them without their Miranda rights, does that mean they're getting cups of tea and being treated in a civil way, or not? What, 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 would you, what, would you what would you bet? Nice. <laughs> what, how, what would you bet? Maybe a glass of water and you can get the DNA. <laughs> well, but we did see in the paper this week there was a, a think tank that uh, issued a report on Bush's torture, and it was rather more pervasive than we thought, even, mm -hmm. and we thought it was pretty bad, and it was coming from on high. And, uh, including Republicans. Uh, including Republicans. Asa Hutchinson was on the committee, so it was not uh, lacking bipartisanship. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just think that that is a black mark on our record, and it always will be. And uh, obviously all the arguments have been made that when our guys get captured, there's nothing to prevent other people from torturing them and saying, 
America does it too. Yeah, it and makes America... it harder to make a case. You know, I mean, speaking of something, I mean, I work with, with the writers organization, Penn, and the thing is, if you go and talk about what's being done to people in other countries, uh, and, and try and persuade that to stop. Well, they'll say, well, what are you doing? What about what's happening in Guantanamo Bay? What's happening here? You know, how can you make a claim of what, about what we should do when you're, when you're doing the same thing? You know, so okay. it, 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 weakens, it weakens the case. Colin, somebody asked, do you think social media contributes to isolation, lack of empathy, and makes people less sensitive to the suffering of others? Good question. Um, yeah, it I think is. There's a, you know, a sense of uh, coolness in the sense that I can want to go play a game with somebody from France and Argentina and Japan all at the same time, but at the same time, how I'm doing that is, yes, yeah, staring at a screen. I'm not actually looking at someone's face. Instead of going outside and knocking on some door and engaging with another human right. being, I'm sitting in a room by myself staring at a screen. I mean, if you ever try to communicate with someone via email or text, I mean, you lose so much of that context, you lose so much of what you're trying to say that I think, I think it does. It's hard, to, it's hard for someone of my generation to relate to that. When the Manti Teo case surfaced, I, I, it was very, I, I mean, I, I couldn't understand it, how you can have a girlfriend that you've never met. I mean, I know what it's like to have a, not to have a girlfriend. <laughs> I, remem I remember those days, but I didn't, I didn't think, long the long past, and I didn't think I had one. I had my hand. <laughs> I knew, but I, you know, I mean, I wasn't fooling myself that my hand was named Lily. You know, I mean, but I would I like mean, to it was named out. Lily, but I mean, I wasn't fooling myself. But I would like to point out that this question is being asked by someone who is watching us online as we speak. Yes, that's right. We're <laughs> online now. Pieces. That's getting yeah. creepy. <laughs> and, and do follow us on Twitter. <laughs> Very true. Uh, okay, Amy. <laughs> Weisenheimer, yes. then let's get, get the next question to you. As an economics graduate, what system would you prefer the government implement to make corporations pay for externalities such as carbon emissions? Uh, what would I advocate for that? Well, I, I don't necessarily advocate corporations paying for externalities like carbon emissions. Really? Really, but I, I don't want really, to go down that road. Be we, we've been down this road before, Bill. It, it ends bad. Right, yeah. global warming's a hoax, I remember. Yes. <laughs> I forgot. It's... Global warming is a hoax, according to today's Republicans, foisted on us by MoveOn.org. You know, radical, radical liberal organizations have made up global warming in order to oppress us. I You're exactly Al... right. I, yeah. thought, I thought it was Al Gore. I thought he was in he, he's with, in there somewhere with, with climate scientists. Yes. They're going to make money off this. Yes, yes. Okay. Um, you're free to go. Thank you very much for <laughs> indulging us tonight, and <laughs> feel safe. A real time with Bill Maher, Friday night at 10. Ask Bill and his guests your questions right after the show at HBO.com.